is Jim Beekler, and uh, Jim is going to talk about physics in the dark. Well, despite the title, I think I'm going to change it after that last talk on how to destroy a paradigm. I don't know. Okay, now the source of nature of both dark matter and dark energy are the crises in physics in our modern day. These make the crises before the second revolution look like petunias. It is generally assumed that explaining either one or both of them together will lead to a scientific revolution. Uh, in 2005, the government formed a dark energy task force, uh, various um, NSF, NSA, Department of Energy and such. Uh, they issued a report, it's been on the internet for four years. Uh, this is not the conclusion, this is a paragraph on the cover page. And you'll notice right in the middle it says, our theories of fundamental particles and gravity are either incomplete or incorrect. Most experts believe that nothing short of a revolution in our understanding of fundamental physics will be required to achieve a full understanding of the cosmic acceleration. But actually it's a revolution in physics, not just for cosmic acceleration. This will not just be a revolution in physics, but a complete revolution that will include both mind or consciousness and matter, normal science. It will be a new way of thinking about our universe because science has found all of a sudden for the first time in history, it has to explain the fundamental nature of matter. It's never had to before. It measured matter, never explained it. And in order to explain matter, you have to differentiate between the consciousness that is interpreting the data and the matter that it is interpreting. Uh, numerous suggestions and hypotheses have been put forward to explain both dark matter and dark energy, but no hypothesis coming out of mainstream physics is either explain one, let alone both of them. Uh, even though most physicists agree that the eventual explanation of them will have to explain both at the same time. Having said that, dark matter and dark matter are easily explained if you just get out of the box. Um, as each uh, dark matter, as each star or star system is added to the galaxy, they form by accretion to the central core. It has a component of gravitational energy or gravitational mass derived velocity, as well as an extra component that corresponds to the four dimensionality of the galactic plane. In other words, I am hypothesizing a macroscopically extended fourth dimension of space or if you want to talk space-time, it's the fifth dimension of space-time. So sometimes I'll talk about the fourth dimension of space, thinking in my Newtonian half, and the other time I'm going to talk about a five-dimensional space-time, talking in my Einsteinian half. And this is just a simple right diagram. The more stars here, this is the positive curvature according to general relativity of the universe. You have matter here, more matter accretes, and slowly the galaxy forms, as it does, it extends outward, but extends outward in both directions according to its own internal three-dimensionality. That three-dimensionality is much stronger than the four-dimensionality of the curve of the universe. I'm talking about an, an extrinsic curvature of the universe. Normal general relativity has an intrinsic curvature and has no need for the higher dimension. So this is an extrinsic curvature. What it does, it opens up a gap between the universe universal curvature and the forming galaxy. This gap cannot happen, but what you have to have is continuity with the rest of the space around, so it forms this. This is the continuity from the rest of the, rest of the open space between galaxies to the galaxy in the fourth dimension. In other words, we're expanding three-dimensionally, but three-dimensionally into the fourth dimension. Now, what we see, though, in reality, what we see, because this curvature does not affect electromagnetism, it's purely material, what we see is the galaxy fits the curvature of the Earth, which leaves a halo around it, which is a curve. Now, that curve is actually due to the interaction of the rest of the matter of the universe and the galaxy, because this curvature is a result of the rest of the matter of the universe. Now, our classical paradigm, this is electromagnetic. You've got a charge in a scalar potential electric field plus the charge moving gives magnetism to the particle moving and then it interacts with the, ve it interacts with the ambient magnetic field. That's a ve vector potential field. 
but gravity is only F is equal to mg, and a scalar potential field. And then that leads to Einstein's relativity. Einstein's relativity, general relativity, this is just the metric of space, space time. This is the new paradigm. This fits that geometrical picture I just showed you. I add a new component here, mv cross gamma. This is this mass, this velocity would be the velocity of stars, the gravitationally derived mass, uh, velocity of stars moving around the galaxy. But then they interact as a cross product, and as a vector potential with gamma, where gamma is that curvature. It represents the gravitational attraction of the rest of the universe. And that's what forms the extra curvature for dark matter. Now, so now what I'm saying, instead of intrinsic geometry for general relativity, we have an extrinsic geometry which requires the higher fourth dimension. Other, it's a real curvature in a higher dimension, not just a, a term that uh, mathematicians put on it. Now, we have scalar potential, scalar potential, which are three-dimensional, vector potential magnetism, and this is also a vector potential field. So, make, so gravity has an as yet unknown, or un, I should say unknown to the paradigm, vector potential field. And if you look at this, this is the rest of the gravity of the universe interacting with mv, the momentum, or the inertia of the body, this is just Mach's principle put in a mathematical form. Mach's principle, is, and we had somebody talk about it yesterday, it's been known for well over 100 years. So in a sense, this is nothing new, but it is new. Now, what we have then is the extrinsic curvature on the outside is dark matter. But at the same time, this vector potential field is dark energy. I just destroyed the paradigm. There's dark matter and dark energy explained. In other words, that extra curvature, that extra curvature, the overall curvature of the universe, is dark matter. Dark energy is the thickness of that curvature. It's not infinitesimally small. It actually has a small thickness in the higher dimension, and that is dark energy. Now we can graph it quite easily. Oops. If we graph the normal gravitational potential, this is galactic core, this is galactic rim, this is F equals mg, this is my new component, which would just be a straight line up here. You add these two together and you get a curve like this, which is, that is the curve off the internet for Andromeda, showing it's a graph of the speeds, rotational speeds around the galactic core as radial distance increases outward. Fits the curve perfectly. Now I can explain that more in, general, in terms of general relativity. This is our normal three-dimensional space. If we look at it intrinsically, then space around, say, this is, this is the curve for, say, the sun. The curve actually gets denser in three-dimensional space. That's the intrinsic curvature. Extrinsic, it would go like this. So this is the curve around the sun. The scalar potential for gravity and or electricity would just be a spot here. Then the vector potential for either magnetism or gravity would be this height up here. So what is a vector potential in three-dimensional space actually becomes a scalar potential in four-dimensional space. Now, uh, this, is, this is a Clifford Newtonian after William King and Clifford because he had four-dimensional space in 1870, a bit before Einstein. So the new curvature would look like this. An object moving around would look like this. This might be the sun. Here's an object moving around the sun. It's got its own curvature, own inherent curvature. This might be Mercury going around the sun, in orbit around the sun. Or this might be um, a star system going around the center of a galaxy. But that's just in, in four-dimensional space with a separate time. That's why it's Clifford Newtonian space. If I put it in space time, so now I've got three-dimensional space laterally, or horizontally laterally, I have fourth dimension, and then time into the screen, it would look like this. So this is the world line from special relativity of the par particle. Now kinemat or dynamic energy in three-dimensional space then becomes kinematics in four-dimensional space or five-dimensional space-time. So then this would be a geodesic in the terms of general relativity. Now to look at the new paradigm then in equation form, what we have is Matter gives rise to what is called the energy stress tensor. The force of gravity becomes g mu nu. This is the metric tensor. 
And the metric tensor, uh, the force of gravity then becomes a constant speed or geodesic moving along the curvature of space, which is represented by this. This is Einstein's equation. But now we have a new additive term that corresponds to a minute term for gravity, and let's call that lambda. So lambda is actually that, that line I showed, that vector, in 4D space-time, or, or 4D space or 5D space-time. Now that lambda is very important. If you know general relativity, you should have already recognized it. Because that lambda has already been added to, general, to the general relativistic equation. It's, it's called lambda CDM, or quintessence, and it's used to most scientists to describe dark matter. So what I'm showing you is the Newtonian equivalent of what's already been done in general relativity to explain dark matter. So we have here my equation again, mv rel cross gamma. But technically, this is gravitational mass, and this is inertial mass. Now, gravitational and inertial mass, somebody talked about the other day. They are mathematically equivalent. They are philosophically different. So these two, mg, mi, have the same value. But that vector that I showed going up in that previous diagram, from third three-dimensional space up to the curvature, is actually inertia. That vector inside a particle, inside a material particle, is inertia. And it defines the curve, and the curve is mass. So all of a sudden, I, now I've equated mass and inertia to each other. That's never been done before either. Now, this mi v rel, this is relative to the central body around which it's orbiting. I call that the flint momentum. You'll see in a moment. Now, if I take this, it's just m0, the rest mass, times ddt of x5. x5 would be a distance in that fifth dimension, g sine theta. And then you rewrite that, because there's no sine theta, it's perpendicular or orthogonal to the three dimensions of space. That gives us back our gamma factor. And this is the key equation. This is the length of that vector in that extra dimension. That defines inertia. Now, the flint momentum. Why do I call that flint momentum? Because there's a scientist called Henry T. Flint that wrote over 35 articles published in respected Royal, Proceedings of the Royal Society and such in Great Britain between 1926 and 1966 explaining this whole theory. So all the mathematics you want for this theory is in Flint's publications. Now Flint relates a basic fundamental electric charge to a 5D momentum, five-dimensional momentum, just like I do. And he defines that as G over alpha C, where alpha is a constant from the Kaluza-Klein theory of the electromagnetic field. And it is a component of momentum with conjugate coordinate U5, which would be the height in the five, fifth dimension. Flint regards the electron photon positron has aspects of the same thing. And if you want to be more mathematical about it, you take an integral of that five-dimensional momentum over each of the five dimensions equal to nh. n would be the principal quantum number, h being the quantum number. So this also defines the quantum. So we have a, the, you have a surface in three-dimensional space curved in the fourth dimension. The ground state would be a sheet. The second sheet, n equals two, the, the in principal quantum number would be the next sheet up, the next sheet up, n equals three, four, and so on. That's how you include quantum. I have just unified gravity, general relativity, and the quantum in five-dimensional space. And most of the work has already been done by Flint. I just added the new term. Now, these are Flint's views of particles. Uh, these are from his personal papers, no date. There are no date on papers, but I assume from the writing that it was written during the 50s or 60s. It seems implied that the simple assumption of fundamental particle is not possible. The limit must result from a relativistic assumption. The only way seems to be a relativistic limit to measurement. So Planck's constant isn't about particles. It is about a relativistic limit to the measurement of objects and their positions in space. So he is using the quantum as a limiting factor with five within a five-dimensional continuous field. And so the fund instead of a fundamental particle would mean a limit exists, but the particle would be available for Lorentz rule of change, a Lorentz a Lorentz, uh, Lorentz transformation or Poincaré transformation, depending on the conditions, of length in motion. The introduction could mean that a limit exists. So Flint knew this. Nobody listened to him. Or a few people did, but he's totally forgotten. He published his final theory in 1966 in a book titled The Quantum Equation of Theory of Fields. It was published by Methuen's, which is a big publisher, 
in their series monographs of physical subjects, and these are the chapters of the book. All the mathematics is there, except for the additional term that I've put in. Now, there are other contributes, contributors. Uh, William Wilson derived the Klein-Gordon equation assuming a five-dimensional volume equal to Schrodinger's wave equation in 1928. Wilson was Flint's teacher and his colleague, at times um, co-author of articles. From 1926 to 66, H.T. Flint incorporated the Yukawa potential, the Dirac equation, and other quantum, uh, fundamental quantum features into the 5D field model. But they're not the only ones. In 1995, Ruby Ho derived the Yukawa potential in nuclear physics directly from the general relativistic 4D model of four-dimensional space model of, or four-dimensional space-time model of space, of, nah. 2000, in 2008, um, a professor from Armstrong University, St. Louis, Shiflet, shows that the Einstein-Schrodinger equation uh, Einstein Schrodinger skew symmetric form of the Einstein equation with lambda CDM implies a five dimensional space time structure. So, uh, this is already, other people have already just about where I am. Now, working, for, working backwards from Shiflet, if the Einstein curvature tensor is five dimensions with both four dimensional symmetric and anti-symmetric parts, both gravity, which is a symmetric part in Newtonian physics, F equals mg, and lambda CDM, the anti symmetric part of the tensor, or what I showed as lambda up there, the MV cross uh, gamma in Newtonian physics are accounted for. What can this explain? Almost everything. I don't believe in the theory of everything. So this only explains almost everything. A common view of the proton, this is quark dynamics, oops, shows a, quark, a proton with two ups and down protons. Those are your quarks. Now there's absolutely no way this can be represented logically because that's a sphere, that's a sphere, that's a sphere. And there's no way you can pack three spherical objects into a bigger spherical object. Impossible. So quantum, most quantum mechanics people assume point charges. So you have a proton point with two up points and a down point in it. Not one of them has dimensions because points are dimensionless. So where the heck do the three dimensions of space come from? It is absolutely impossible for particle physicists to depict quarks in any logical matter. Why? Because there are no physical particles called quarks. They are just mathematical entities, and there's absolutely nothing in the mathematics of quantum theory that requires particles. Their particles are superimposed onto the mathematics. This is what quarks really are. This is proton-proton collision. You've got a proton coming in to hit another one. This proton is accelerated up to high enough speed to show quarks, but it's also Lorentz Fitzgerald contracted. It's Lorentz Fitzgerald contracted down to the point, the quantum minimum of measurement. Therefore, when it hits this proton, it compresses it like a balloon being squashed. Its, its rate of speed gives a negative one-third electron, and that leaves two-thirds electron vertically and two-thirds electron charge horizontally. And that is according to something called Pascal's principle, which has been known for about three or 400 years in physics. The quantum electric charge E is just a strain in the surrounding space due to an internal stress in real extended particles. And a quark is just how that stress is redistributed along the three dimension of space due to the collision. Within a particle, according to a quantized Pascal's principle, during a sufficiently energetic collision with another real extended particle. And I have just destroyed the standard model of physics because the quarks are the basis of the standard model of physics. Goodbye and good riddance to particle physics. <laughs> what does this theory predict? No theory is good without predictions. Well, the existence of dark matter halos around all material objects, not galaxies, around all material objects. Galaxies, stars, and planets. And I'm willing to bet, I haven't worked out the mathematics, I'm willing to bet that you take the dark matter components of the planets and our sun, and you will be able, together they will give you the tightest Bode law, which has never been explained. I haven't done that yet, but someday I will. The shape of dark matter halos would be spherical around individual objects, but elliptical around galaxies. That was shown just a couple of months ago. The elliptical dark matter halos around galaxies. 
and additional velocity due to that extra effect. When you do a slingshot effect around a planet, NASA just released that information a year ago, the um, Voyagers leaving the solar system are, have an extra component of speed. Why? Because they're falling down the dark matter uh, gradient and they're picking up dark energy. It's giving them the extra components of speed. Um, the existence of ultra-high speed ionized particles, cosmic rays exiting galaxies. That has been found, ultra-high speed cosmic rays. They don't know how to explain it because cosmic rays come from charged particles accelerated by magnetic fields. That's normal cosmic rays. But if you go to, I'll be finished in a minute. If you go to my model, you have an extra acceleration of those particles due to their mass, not their electric charge, but due to their mass. That gives us ultra high speed cosmic particles, which have been discovered and they have no idea what they are. An increasing rate of expansion of the universe as well as a corresponding decrease in earlier times, that can be checked. The existence of a proton dominated universe. You always wonder why no antiprotons. This theory explains it well. You can calculate the amount of dark energy in any 3D volume of space from my simple geometric model. Gal galactic diameters are slightly less than predicted by normal gravity theory. These are all predictions. They've either already been shown or they can be tested. So this is ultimately falsifiable. Um, the basic equations. Einstein, four-dimensional space-time, five-dimensional space-time, where the gamma takes place of G. The symmetric part of it gives the normal G mu V, which is Einstein's tensor, and lambda G mu, which is the um, lambda CDM. And if I go back to this original equation, and for my MV, substitute de Broglie's matter wave, I have just quantized gravity. Welcome to the era of quantum gravity. It is an accomplished fact, without particles. That should be about it. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, anybody like to address any questions to Jim? I New York will. Please I come up here. <laughs> You're York Dobbins, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> His reputation proceeds. In. It's hard to pick out just one item to uh, to comment on or question, but. About halfway through the paper or thereabouts, uh, you make an identification between the uh, V cross gamma term and the cosmological constant lambda. And there's a certain conceptual problem with that because uh, lambda is, in fact, a constant. It has no transformation properties. It looks the same to all observers, whereas vector V cross vector gamma is a a vector that points in some particular direction and is uh, dependent on the uh, velocity v that goes into it. There are quantities of, of completely different types. Uh, if you think three-dimensionally, but if you think four-dimensionally, it's a scalar. It becomes a scalar up on that extrinsic curve, which would be a constant. Now, um, also, you're thinking in terms of vectors. And this is done in terms of quaternions, the, as originally done by Clifford in the 1870s. And quaternions, even in the 1870s, were four-dimensional quantities before they were reduced by Gibbs to three-dimensional quantities. Are there any further questions? I escape. So there, York. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting more questions from work. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> One other quick thing. This is the same theory that last year I 